Welcome everyone. Um, today marks the start of the annual Art Prospect Festival and the ArtsLink Assembly. I'm Susan Katz, Program Director of CC ArtsLink based in St. Petersburg, Russia. The conversation today is going to be in both Russian and English, and you can choose which language you want to listen Art to um, by the using Arts the Assembly. round I'm globe Katz, at the bottom Program of Director the screen. Of CC ArtsLink based um, the ArtsLink Assembly is a series of online talks and webinars featuring artists and arts leaders from around the globe, addressing some of the key issues facing the world as we enter the pand pandemic and beyond. The Art Prospect Festival is a public art festival of cited temporary artworks based in St. Petersburg. This year in response to the pandemic, the festival is taking place on site and online in 23 cities and 13 countries with commissioned projects by over 50 artists. You can see the full program and learn about the projects at artprospect.org and also on the CEC Arts Link website. I wanna thank all the artists who contributed to work for the festival and the amazing Art Prospect team who put everything together on site and online. We're thrilled that an artist and good friend, Kendall Henry, director of New York's Percent for Art program, who has participated in the Art Prospect F Festival since its creation in 2012, will discuss this year's festival with several of the participating artists and curators. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Um, now I'll turn it over to Kendall. Thanks, Susan. Um, you know, I'm very sorry that this pandemic is happening. You know, the festival has always been a highlight of, of the year, uh, coming together in St. Petersburg or in, in the past, Bishkek and uh, other places like um, like in the Ukraine. And uh, but you know, we, we make do with what we have to make do with. And so, so today, you know, to to sort of launch off the the fetish, the pedest, the festival as we usually do, um, we have this talk, and um, we're going to hear from a number of, of, of participants, and I'm gonna ask them to give a quick introduction before they give their presentations, and uh, let's have a conversation. This is a very open and relaxed conversation, so please, if you have any questions, this is us, just a whole bunch of friends having a bit of a chat about the world we live in today, about the things, that, the issues that we're facing, and, um, and until we get to meet again, you know, this is one of the best ways, and uh, we get to to engage and you know and, and thanks to CEC for being very creative in, in having us do this this way and still keep the festival alive because I think again this is so important uh, particularly right now. So I'm going to ask uh, Lyra to sort of start and by you know giving a bit of an introduction and giving us a, a whole overview of, of this year's festival. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to introduce the team of the Art Prospect Festival at the Assembly. This year, the festival has been uh, created by six curators, and I'm one of the six curators. Uh, and uh, other curators include uh, Lizaveta Matveyeva, Natasha Ergens, Taisia Abich, Veronika Nikiforova, and Yekaterina Sokolovska. This year, the topic of our festival is uh, treasure hunt. And our seventh uh, festival is no different from the previous festivals we had, uh, Art Prospect, Prospect festivals we had. Since the topic of the festivals is always broad, but each work of art created by artists for the festival always fits uh, its time and environment and space. And this year, each artist finds hunt, uh, find treasures uh, on this border in this borderline space between private and public space. And the works you're going to see uh, at the festival, uh, they're placed uh, in the windows, on balconies, in gardens, in private gardens, uh, and the viewers can visit them. And 
uh, in uh, in various places where you can actually keep distance uh, in the mountains uh, in the courtyards there are some works uh, that you find on the wind uh, on the car windows each participant uh, has uh, their own definition for treasure. For some, this treasure is an ability to speak publicly about depression. Uh, I'm talking about Anna Tereshka and Nastya Makarenka and their, uh, and their drama piece. Or treasure uh, is an ability to understand the city as your fellow friend, like in Sasha Zubritskaya's work. A treasure is to have your personal space. This is what Fyodor Hirashigi tells us when he emerges in a mushroom, in, uh, as a mushroom on his balcony and uh, engaging into a silent dialogue. A treasure is uh, an ability to move in space. And this is what something uh, uh, that characters from the Chroma K uh, play do. Treasure is being able to create art using uh, everything you've got without having a chance to uh, exit uh, your house, like in Silesnova's uh, uh, work. Or a treasure is uh, being able to invite your friends into your garden. These treasures can be seen at our festival. The festival has two uh, dimensions. One is intervention. And if you download an app, uh, you will be able to see a map, dots, and uh, when you click on these dots, you learn more about the works of the artists and about the schedule. And the second uh, dimension is augmented reality. Uh, it exists in the uh, Gaza Culture House uh, in St. Petersburg, and you can go there. And if you um, if you use your telephone and, uh, and uh, read the special signals or symbols in this uh, Gaza, Gaza house, you will be able to discover treasures for yourself. Um, please follow up uh, with our public program and you can become part of the dialogue with the artists in the Instagram, uh, in Facebook and on the festival website. So this year, we're having uh, our festival both online and offline. Thank you. Thank you, Rera. Um, I, I just want to reiterate, yes, please, you know, uh, check out the, the, the website and participate as much as you can. And uh, I think a lot of it is going to be streaming on CEC's Instagram um, feed. So keep an eye on that. So to begin our presentations today, um, by our artist, I'll ask the artist just give a brief a brief introduction as to who you are, and and you know, walk us through what your what you have proposed and what your presentation what your project is for for this year's uh, Arts Prospect Festival. I'm going to start with Alessia. Uh, да, всем привет. Yes. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Alessia Ilyanok, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist. And within this Art Prospect Festival, I'm uh, presenting uh, a project. And I will share my screen now, and I'll be more specific about the project. Well, Wolf of Scroll is the title of the project. My project, if you give a brief description, is a practice of street art in the digital in the digital layer of the city's public space. And to tell you about uh, it in detail, I probably need uh, 
to, I need to show you the lens I use to work uh, in my project. And uh, first, I'd like to, to say that I see a city and public space through uh, the lens of a term, uh, digital scene. Digital scene is the era, the time we live in, and you have to understand, uh, what you have to understand about it is that the digital and the analog are integrated closely and we can't separate them from one another. So if we look at the city through the digital scene lens, we see it as a hybrid space where we leave our digital and analog traces. We pay with credit cards, we use GPS in our mobiles, we post our photos with uh, geotags uh, in uh, social networks. Uh, so public space also changes within the city. And today I see, uh, see public space not only as a physical space of your presence, but rather as something that we pay our, our attention to. As users, we may be sitting in a coffee house, but our public space will be Skype. Uh, this is the public space we are in, if we are calling something, for example. Uh, this is why uh, I see public space as an Instagram space in my project. So the city, we have two cities, Vladivostok and St. Petersburg. The reason is uh, we first had this Wall for Scroll project in Vladivostok. And this year, thanks to the uh, Art Prospect Festival, we are uh, launching this, pro this project in uh, St. Petersburg during the festival. To create my project, I, I took three steps. First, I created digital objects. Uh, then I uh, selected objects for geotagging. And then I, and after that, I placed them in the Instagram stories. I worked with algorithms and uh, neuron networks because I was interested in this uh, machine mistake. I took 3D uh, images of uh, various spaces and I turned them into, I transferred them into text and using uh, an algorithm, a Markov algorithm, I generated new messages. I selected the messages that were most poetic. I also walked around the city using Google Earth service and I made pictures of the city. Uh, but I was looking for spaces where you could find something atypical or an unusual angle. And uh, I had a 2D image uh, that I lent later turned into a 3D image using a neural network uh, that was trying the neural network was looking for a volume in this two, uh, 2D um, uh, picture. Uh, so thus, the machine was trying to create a new object. In this video, you can see how many spots uh, are involved in this Wall for Scroll project. We have 21 spots. Each spot is a digital object uh, that is linked to to the, to the uh, Google Earth spot, to a real object. And you can imagine how someone walks around St. Petersburg's uh, uh, visiting locations of the festival, and uh, they might be passing uh, the spots that are covered by my project. And later uh, on the Instagram, in stories, they will uh, see my digital interve interventions. They don't have any specific aim or goal behind them. They're only showing a message from an artist to the viewer. What I like about this uh, juxtaposition or this clash between the message and the viewer, uh, it is very much like street art when you walk around the city and you see a writing on a wall. You may uh, ignore it or you may see it. Or, uh, in my case, you, can, you might just scroll it. You might uh, live it outside the, your attention span.
And uh, thus, my project, uh, as part of street art, remains anonymous. It is site specific and it adds some new aesthetics to the street art. И чтобы закончить, я еще хочу рассказать, так как у нас сегодня такое интересное, провела проект во Владивостоке. Получили всего uh got most of the people involved i mean they had more people involved than any other uh, we had like 24000 view views uh, of the project of the project and these three uh, objects were most viewed during the the project people would watch them for the for six for six seconds they didn't swipe these images uh, i think it has to do with the fact that these objects are, are located uh, in spots where you have a lot of cars and you have traffic jams there. Uh, so when people are, uh, jam are sitting in their cars in a traffic jam, and uh, this is the time where, when, when can, you, you can send your artistic message to them and it gets to them while they're sitting in, in a car. Thank you. This is basically it. Thank you so much. That's an incredible project. Um, can't wait to talk about it in, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, next, you have uh, Nadia. Talk about your, yourself and your project. Всем привет. Я очень рада всех приветствовать на. First of all, I'm very happy to greet everyone and to welcome everyone uh, at our online art prospect. Uh, and I'm happy it's happening both off and online. I'll tell about a few words about myself. Uh, I'm from Minsk, Belarus. I'm an artist from Minsk, Belarus. Разные формы, инсталляция, перформанс, иногда живопись, какие-то painting, uh, research works, and thematically, well, I don't think I can, I don't, I have some certain framework or set up. Uh, 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 I do works about self-reflection, about feminist uh, agenda, memory, uh, and this is probably uh, uh, all my projects is um, me wanting to be a mediator, uh, someone who carries information for working physically uh, as a mediator, using myself as an object. Oh, Nadia is muted. Uh, Nadia, you went muted. Я прошу прощения, видимо, я нажала дважды случайно. Все сначала, да, я очень быстро. Хорошо. Мне повторить сначала или нет, я уточню. Или что-то успели услышать. Хорошо. Все. Отлично, спасибо. Итак, проект Trash Art Cash представляет собой тоже своего рода медиацию. The в моем медиацию через публичное поле. Возникло, наверное, я даже с этого начну. Я думаю, что много... The idea has to do with the Belarus and uh, it used to be relevant for former Soviet republics, countries that are former Soviet republics. But the idea was that one of the reasons why I had this idea was to use mussel containers as a container for some very critical messages, which were related to the political situation in our country. Uh, have now been used as uh, carriers of some very critical messages. And it has to do with the political situation in the country. And one couldn't help but noticing it. Uh, it's uh, a bit different from the graffiti. Used to, um, there are a lot of graffiti on, on trash cans. And they're more and more creative. And they sometimes uh, would appear uh, um, 
I'm not uh, would appear uh, randomly, uh, and uh, even the. Uh, поэтому я подумал о том, что действительно вот этот такой бытовой момент, который сохранился у нас бытовой ритуал. Connection. And uh, uh, thus I uh, looked uh, uh, at uh, a different uh, contextual uh, Belarusian thing. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a system systemic uh, uh, history of contemporary ra art in Belarus. Over the past uh, two decades, we have some spontaneous projects, one-year projects, info portal. They publish uh, wonderful articles. They start talking about uh, contemporary artists. They try to dig into the history. They try to register it, but uh, they only last for a year or two, and uh, uh, later they they become abandoned. I mean, uh, uh, any contemporary artist or anyone interested in contemporary art has no uh, chance to learn about the uh, many important projects and many important works, and you uh, can't even uh, learn the names. I, you, you don't even know the names. So I thought it was a very good way to uh, let people know uh, about the key uh, projects that have to do with trash cans. Uh, Belarus artists uh, who uh, somehow express themselves on trash ca ca cans uh, also present their graphic works and installations uh, on several uh, trash cans in, in Minsk uh, uh, that are located in courtyards or in public spaces like at the Academy of Fine Arts uh, yard. Uh, we placed QR codes on those cans, on those bins, and uh, this QR code, code leads you to a website, uh, and you can, uh, from that website, you can go to other sites, uh, learn about uh, the project itself, and learn about uh, uh, the Belarusian artists uh, who worked with trash bin and trash cans and etc cetera, etc cetera. so for those uh, who are in minsk and in molodechna another belarusian uh, town uh, you can go to the you know to those yards courtyards with trash bins and uh, uh, learn about uh, belarusian artists and you can do it online as well uh, you can use a QR code uh, on the photo of an object or or you use a link on a website uh, and you can go there from the art prospect platform this is basically it I mean it's a very simple project as such are you going to show us some images there Nadia Да, да, я прошу прощения, теряюсь немножко. Yes, sorry, I'm a bit uh, distracted by. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some. Я совершенно по минимуму все решила подобрать. То есть I took just three pictures uh, for you to have an idea uh, what's going on. I mean, how does it look? I mean, how does this message look like in public space? Uh, in Belarus, you, uh, what you see here are names of Belarusian TV channels, and one of the uh, 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 body. 
So it's a very classical thing. Стало толчком для и, конечно, было включено в сам проект. They represent TV channels and law enforcement bodies as trash cans, as trash bins. This project shows these this trash art as means of anonymous expressions. This is how a QR code on a trash can looks like, and it leads you to a website. And this is how a website sees it. This is a fragment from from the works displayed. Uh, you can see uh, uh, an, an exhibition and a work uh, from 1997 by Andrei Dureka and other works uh, and interpretations of these objects. So this is how it looks like from your PC. But I guess people will be rather using telephones. Well, this is basically it. Thank you so much, Nadia. And uh, next, we're going to hear from Annie. Uh, if you could introduce yourself and, and take us to your project. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, and thank you to CEC ArtsLink and our prospect for um, having me. Uh, this is a really interesting topic, especially as an artist that works and collaborates with other artists and community members to produce work in public space. So. It's been an interesting time filled with lots of interesting uh, innovation. Uh, my name is Annie L. Bagley. I am an artist that is based out of San Francisco um, on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Ohlone people. And I'm currently an artist in residence at the Marin Headlands um, at the Headland Center for the Arts in Salcedo, California. And in 2018, I was fortunate to participate in CUC's back apartment residency and produce the work Fido Bar or a memory for a remedy uh, for art prospect of that year. And it was an archive of Russian folk ingenuity. It explored how a society regulates medical care in the absence of necessary infrastructure and how communities relationships to the environment might change when they become more reliant on it. Um, but for this year, I produced a score, um, a breath score that is activated through an anchor image at the uh, Gaza Cultural House. So because this is a sound work, I'm just going to have some video and images playing as I talk. Um, so I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, the f and I'll talk a little bit about how that work relates to the work that I made. The first image is of the work installed on site. And my project is very simple. It is called A Breath Together. And it is a score of my friends and family breathing together. And this project began a little bit after uh, San Francisco went into lockdown. And I began to see how serious this time was going to be and maybe how isolating it was going to be. Um, away from uh, people that I loved, people that I work with. And so a byproduct of us being together inevitably, whether or not we're conscious of it explicitly is our breath and us breathing together, um, air moving in through us, around us in these, in these rhythmic cycles. It's uh, something that binds us to a space and a moment. And now it's something that we maybe fear, push against, we're worried about because of this virus. Um, and to contextualize this a little bit further in California, here you can see an image of my sh running shoes and the light is completely orange. It's covered in ash because the air here is um, overrun with the smoke from wildfires. So breath and, and air is mediated even further uh, during this time. So I wanted to, I, as I was soliciting these um, recordings, I was also thinking about how can we be together in a way that isn't too reliant on language. Um, I think right now, 
I don't know about you, but I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> and <laughs> I want time away from language. I want to notice the nuance of people's bodies in a very simple and pared down way. And maybe that's something that's also a byproduct of the pandemic where suddenly like our lives are much more pared down and rooted in where we are rather than like the noise of all the things we used to have to do and places we used to have to be. This image, I also wanted to share with you other images of, of the air in San Francisco. This is the iconic fog of, that surrounds my studio, which is pretty heavy. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to think about being together without language and breath and a score around breath was one way to do that. Um, I also was thinking about um, the newfound intimacy that we're having in these digital platforms. So as in 2018, maybe we were gonna meet in a lecture hall and we would all come to the same place. Now through Zoom and these other um, technologies that we're using, we're seeing different contexts of our bodies and ourselves. So you're meeting me in my house, you know, you wouldn't have, I wouldn't have brought my house with me to Russia. Um, so I think it's interesting. So it's both a visual context and it's also a sonic context. Maybe you can hear my dog crying outside my door in the background, you know? So these are all things that build and become part of me now within, the context that you're hearing me talk. And um, I think that that also happens a little bit in the score itself where we hear like the sounds of birds or animals or vehicles that help contextualize these, these different bodies and where they're producing this breath uh, from. I am also thinking about this in relationship to viewer participation. And uh, when I was making this project I was becoming very aware of my own breath. And so I'm hoping that with each experience of this project, that it's different for each person, obviously, but that they're also a contributor to the, to the sound itself and that they become aware of their own breath and invoking St. Petersburg within the, within the project itself. So I guess that is a breath together. Thank you, Annie. And, and where, where can we hear the score? Maybe CEC can answer that better, but that is at the Gaza Culture House in St. Okay. Petersburg. Okay, super. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, we have uh, Nastya is going to give us her presentation and an introduction. Всем привет. Меня зовут Настя. Everyone. My name is Nastya Babitska. I'm an artist from St. Petersburg. I work mainly with uh, the fragility, with uh, um, anguish uh, uh, that uh, we experience when uh, we encounter, when our public space interacts with, uh, when our private space interacts with public space. And I would also wanted to share my own uh, feelings I had during lockdown I'll share my screen now. Расскажу немного про историю создания. A bit more about uh, my my project. It's it's called Vacation. Can you see my screen now? В общем, расскажу предысторию. I go back to to the to the photos. I hope you can see them now. Yep. Yep. So the idea um, of the project, uh, I had it during uh, the first week of May when we have our public holidays, and we were all already in lockdown. And once I had a stroll, took a stroll uh, in the area where I live, and I heard them. Uh, on the loudspeaker, congratulating people on the Victory Day, and the next phrase 
uh, was a warning uh, uh, telling people not to go out, not to, to be in public places and uh, asking people to stay at home in lockdown and uh, isolate themselves. So I stopped uh, and listened to those uh, contradictory messages. <laughs> Uh, coming from the loudspeaker, and they were a bit menacing, uh, at least I felt them menacing. And I thought that during this time, I mean, in early May, uh, we have public holidays or banking holidays, and it's like a short vacation, and usually the weather is fine by, uh, by, the, by early May, and people would go to the countryside with their friends and families, or, you know, take short trips and go somewhere this year everybody had to stay at home and uh, people had this forced vac uh, lockdown vacation and they they had to stay in this uh, space in this house space so the first part of my uh, project was done in in my apartment uh, so you can see the wallpaper uh, with an ideal beach uh, that could be an Instagram background uh, and, uh, to show something that doesn't really exist, something false, something phony. Uh, my project also in, includes a video where I used uh, I used the sound from the loudspeaker and and using the objects that you see in the photo, I wanted to create this uh, worrisome, uh, even paranoid atmosphere with this uh, uh, little swimming pool for kids, a pool for kids, uh, feeling helpless, feeling uh, strange, bizarre. I relived my childhood experiences. So this uh, in-house space for many people was the only available space. The only space available. And uh, as uh, Annie has said, apart from being the only available space, uh, it became uh, visible to everyone we all see each other's uh, apartment you can see my room behind me and we we had audiences all of a sudden our private space uh, has become public space and this is uh, what the second part of my project tells about uh, it is shown uh, at the festival as private uh, it shows how a private space enters public space and uh, you can see in the photo my house uh, my, my house and the facade uh, of my house with my windows and they're all uh, blocked with this uh, wallpaper and you can't really guess what's happening behind this wallpaper and I also wanted to say that uh, by demonstrating your private in the public space, you not necessarily uh, demonstrate or show something real. You might be showing some constructed reality or maybe negating uh, the realities that is happening. Because during uh, quarantine, many friends of mine would uh, post their previous travels, their pre uh, photos from their previous trips and travels, trying to negate the existing reality and showing that uh, the things they lacked. I'll show you a, a bigger image. My neighbors, they uh, had some uh, folio uh, some ref uh, reflection paper uh, glued to their uh, to their balcony. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I guess you're not gonna. Are you gonna try to show us the bigger image there, or? Okay, well, we're gonna move on. Uh, 
so I want to thank all the the artists and Lyra for presenting. And so one of my first questions, and I just want to reiterate that if you have any questions, please put them in the questions and answer um, section and we'll, we'll try to answer them as we move along. So one of the things about the, the many years of the Art Prospect Festival is the one of the, the aims of the festival was you know, like bringing people into these public spaces and experiencing the public spaces through, um, through artwork. And it's a, it's a public art festival. And so one of the key components of that is, you know, the public space. And I want to start with Lara with this question, but I want everybody else to answer it, is in developing this, this festival and curating the festival, um, how have you had to redefine the public space? And, and you know, a, a couple of you sort of touched on how your private spaces have become public spaces. And, and you know, thinking about that, how have... The, how has has you thinking? How has your thought process around the public space changed throughout con conceptualizing an idea for this project, and and um, and how has that evolved? And but Lear, really thinking about the festival as a whole, how have you had to rethink public space when thinking about these projects? Uh. Well, thank you for the question, Kendall. It was this redefining, rethinking of public space. Uh, I think it happened not only as part of the festival, it is rather a global global rethinking, redefining that is happening with time, uh, with uh, technology evolving. And this year we had this, uh, well, it happened faster. It's it sped up uh, uh, due to pandemics. And uh, we as curators could not help but noticing these changes. And we suggested uh, to the artists that they should, you know, work with the existing reality, with the actual reality. And here I think for the festival, what is important for the festival uh, is each and every artist's answer to this challenge. Uh, because a festival is a conceptual framework. It sets uh, up a very general field for thought, but each author, each artist finds their private, uh, the unique uh, definition of this state. Each artist intuitively or consciously can formulate it uh, better or in, in a more precise way than the festival does it in general. Have I answered your question? Uh, you definitely have, definitely have. So, so uh, the follow-up to that, um, well, I'm gonna come back to you on that, but I, I, I'm curious about the others. Um, how have you had to redefine public space when thinking about your work? I'm going to call on you, Annie. Cool. <laughs> um, well, I think, like, it, just to echo some, like, a theme that arose from everybody's um, or most presenters is, is the intimacy that becomes public. But I think also um, what's happening now is because so much public space is unfolding online where we're meeting, there's more of a democratic. Um, proliferation of artwork and access, which I think is an interesting byproduct. Um, and it's interesting also that intimacy is infused in that in a weird way. So I won't, I mean, I will say, you know, like there's a lot more solitary making, which is difficult. And it's really hard when you get the Zoom face, you know, um, from being on Zoom too much. But um, yeah, I think it's more, 
the intimacy being public and also um, this issue of access is very interesting uh, to me. And I'm interested to see what will happen with that post pandemic. And, and, and Nastya, you, you have the sort of the same kind of situation with Annie in terms of, you know, you're introducing people to your private, your, your very private space and it's becoming public. And, and so how has that, um, how is that, a, how, how are you dealing with that? How has that been part of your, your thinking process? I wanted to focus on the fact that this demonstration of your intimate, of your private uh, into the public does not always uh, uh, help you to uh, understand and to learn about the person's reality. What you project through internet or what I project on my windows uh, within the festival's project might not add anything, uh, might not give anything to the audience uh, and to the one, to the person who demonstrates it. Uh, your in-house space has been always this territory of personal comfort. And when you dissolve these borders between the private and the public, this safety uh, and security uh, notion is being dissolved as well. And I haven't yet defined for myself how am I, how am I doing with this thought? How, am I, how do I live with this thought? Uh, what is important for me? I mean, it's important for me to be secure at my home, uh, but even showing my project in the courtyard, it's very interesting to see how my neighbors react. My neighbors, uh, judging from my previous projects, uh, they see courtyard space as a, a territory they need to feel secure and any intervention into this space as like like my project is they feel those interventions as an attack or they re read them as a danger and they want to protect their territory and their courtyard territory let alone their apartment territory so i think that this uh, dissolving of borders and demonstrating your private in the public space uh, is a has a you know is, is viewed in a twofold way i mean in, in it's a dialectical question how do you treat it i don't think i have an exact and precise answer uh, what we un we do understand we understand it's an inevitable process that is going on now yeah and and you know uh, and you know the two of you annie and nastya you sort of there's a, a reoccurring theme that I, I, I heard when you were talking about your presentations and there were words like depression and vulnerability and, and, and isolation and anguish and fragility. Um, and, you know, this, I think, is a lot of what people are feeling, right? Um, because we, we sort of, most of us, if not all of us, was in some sort of lockdown, which meant that we couldn't communicate physically with people, which meant that... Um, you know, there was a fear of actual death if you sort of, you know, interacted. So how has some of those topics of depression and vulnerability and isolation and anguish, how is that, why, why do you think, why did you think you needed to sort of illustrate that in, in, in your work? You know, how important was it that that came out in your work? I can just briefly say that for um, I'm I'm really interested in like the fragility of the body. I mean, I think it's always been there, and now it's like top of mind for all of us. And so, feeling like the softness of the body and being reminded of that as we like move forward with practices of care and concern for one another, I think is is really important right now. So. Do you want to add anything to that, uh, Nastya? Yes, I totally agree with Annie. And I wanted to add that uh, over this last six months, 
Uh, and now, uh, what is important is to talk about people's feelings. Uh, as I mentioned already, some people found themselves uh, in this solitary situation for the first time, you know, uh, being with their feelings, with their emotions, and they were not ready, and they are not ready to accept it. And they're trying various ways uh, to press it, to suppress it, and to kill these feelings. And it often leads to um, to worse uh, uh, outcomes. This is why I think that uh, demonstrating it through art projects is an important step towards, uh, you know, self-therapeutical uh, mode. Uh, being able to talk about it with yourself makes you able to talk about it with other people. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And, and, and so part of that too is, you know, reaching out to as many people as possible. And, you know, like Lara, you mentioned that, um, you know, when we th rethinking the public space, you know, we, we go to the digital format, we go to uh, social media and, and those platforms uh, to sort of engage within these spaces. And um, Nadia, your, your work, and as well as Liesa's work, you know, depend on, you know, that, that realm, that, that sort of space. And um, one of the things that we try to think about is how, how do we reach people within those spaces? And, and what is that message? And, and I just wonder if you could talk about, you know, what are some of the expectations or what are some of the ways that you, how should I say, how, how has the reach been uh, for, for in, 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 in these spaces? Because I'm, in, in one of your, your projects, Lisa, you said you reached 24,000 views and, and, and that sort of was a highlight of, of understanding that the communication was happening. So how important was that in, in those platforms? It's a question to Lesia, I guess. Uh, uh, well, I was talking about uh, yeah, uh, I think I, I got confused with the numbers. I, I just wanted to say uh, that um, if we're talking about, you know, private and public, the idea is not a new one. Uh, and social networks, once they become popular, they became popular before pandemics and before Zoom and before those endless uh, online conferences, we started to uh, uh, show ourselves, to post ourselves uh, in the social networks. Uh, our private life, lives have become public. Uh, being a researcher, I study the city. And in my project, I'm looking at the changes uh, of uh, urban uh, public spaces uh, through technology. And if we're talking about, and I'll repeat that, uh, if we're saying that we're using these digital spaces as public spaces, uh, even when we are physically in public spaces, it means that uh, digital spaces, digital reality and digital spaces, they take the same place in our life as the physical ones. And we need to see them as equal. Uh, and our digital bodies, our digital meetings uh, equal our physical bodies and our physical communication. Uh, speaking about involvement and engaging uh, people in the project, uh, what I find interesting, when you're working in, a, in the street as an artist, when you're making a work in, in the street, you may uh, uh, have feedback in the same, only in the same digital space. You can see photos, documentation of your work, um, in, the, in, the, in the viewers' accounts, so people may send you a link uh, to a photo they made. Uh, and I 
I use uh, uh, tools uh, that you normally use, uh, uh, for example, on Facebook to place adverts, and they allow me to analyze the reaction towards each of my digital objects. And it also allows me to do some research uh, to study how people read uh, certain messages, how they read uh, spots, how they see spots, and try and understand why uh, a certain message reached out and the other one didn't. And people would just, you know, swipe or, uh, and why would people be uh, engaged in some uh, objects? And maybe the message has reached the audience. Um, and after Vladivostok project, I can already have some analysis and evaluation because we've had this project finished in Vladivostok. And the trend is that people uh, go everywhere by car. People seldom uh, walk on food, and my messages uh, were best seen uh, at the spots where you have traffic jams. So people being in the car, they can, you know, see my artistic message. In uh, St. Petersburg case, uh, well, I cannot comment so far because we've only launched it. Uh, we're launching it today. Uh, October the 15th, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what difference when you try try this project out in different cities. Um, how does digital message in the digital space, in public space, uh, can be perceived in a different way, uh, depending on the city? I will probably add on my behalf to to follow up. For me, it was also part of my work. It's a research, uh, and I'll be able to to evaluate uh, after a couple of days and to assess, uh, you know, the uh, how many people uh, use the QR code to go on the website. And for me, it is an important uh, uh, this this. Uh, our information about artists not being accessible uh, it's not it's not accessible even without pandemics uh, even with this global accessibility uh, uh, when I when I talked to my colleagues uh, uh, kept saying yeah we have a lot of platforms uh, it has become more democratic but we don't have time to digest it uh, we're we find ourselves in this internet field and it's it, it only makes it more difficult to uh, to take art in I mean it's it's uh, uh, and what happens when you uh, stumble upon art somewhere where you don't expect it to be um, and uh, and when you have to do something uh, extra uh, to go uh, somewhere, uh, to, when you can't go to a gallery uh, and you can find uh, some, some information about art uh, uh, where you would never have found it uh, had there been no pandemics. Okay. And, and so that, that brings me to my next question. So we are in a pandemic. We are, um, we do have to isolate for at least for a period of time. Um, there is a, a bit of isolation, like some of you mentioned, there is, you know, the vulnerability and all that. Uh, so what has all of this situation, and I want everybody to answer, um, including you, Lara, what has this uh, told you about yourself as an artist? Uh, what has it taught you about your practice, how you make work, and uh, and the message in your work, right? This is a, so. What has all of this taught you about yourself? You know, maybe you've discovered that you don't like to be isolated, but maybe you discovered that. You know, what has it taught you about yourself, your work, and the message that you put forth in your work? Okay, Lara, you start. 
which gives you time for your others to think about that answer. <laughs> Well, if we're talking about isolation and the message, the message that I personally uh, took from it, or this time has given me, it's very simple. For each and every one of us, and for me personally, uh, what is important for, for me, it is the community support that is important uh, for what I do. Uh, we work with communities, and I work with communities, and when I found myself in isolation, when all my projects were cancelled, basically I was ready to do you know to to raise chicken yeah, uh, i started to study to study breeds i mean i i looked into breeds but i was lucky i saw that this new situation um, uh, offers new grants for communities and for community work and i found uh, opportunities to apply for grants and to keep working. I think this opportunity for a dialogue in this new setting, this is something that uh, really supports me as a curator and as an artist. So I'm really grateful, thankful to everyone who finds uh, strength and will to be in touch, to keep in touch and to support each other in the dialogue. Thank you. I'm going to call on you next, Annie. Cool. Uh, interesting thing. Um, well, um, I guess I'll start with like an anecdote, which is that I remember the first time that I met with my collaborators after being like isolated for a while and we met outside at the beach and we like spoke for, I think like two or three hours outside. And I remember leaving that meeting, like I was buzzed or high because like suddenly I was with people again that I cared deeply about. And so I think that is something that has always been present in my life is like care for community and collaborating. And like, it was just felt to such an extreme after having been uh, is like in isolation for a while. And I'm curious, I read this um, article on EFLUX in March um, by Franco Berardi, and he talks about how are we all going to kind of be sick of all of this technological mediation that when the pandemic ends, like that we will kind of forego that because we associate it with sickness and we like kind of only work together kind of more in person and that's more of the focus. And I guess I, I felt like I mean, who knows what will happen, how our lives will proceed from here. But um, I felt like a, a kinship with that idea. Um, I think one thing that this has pushed me to do in my practice is collaborate more with the environment, um, with non-humans um, in my work. And at the Headlands, because it's part of the park service, it's, there's been a lot of opportunity there to kind of um, do a lot more research into the um, different ecologies that are there and environments. So that's been a very interesting uh, thing. And um, I've also taken play or been a part of like a lot of um, seminars online, which has been uh, also very interesting to have a lot more international perspectives um, more consistently um, in my work. So that's been a big positive thing. Thank you. Nastya? No, yeah, I agree both with Lera and with Annie. You know, but as an artist, I feel fine to work alone and to, to make my projects on my own. Um, on the other hand, I'm working with uh, sculpture 
a lot and uh, exhibiting it uh, exhibiting it in digital space and to look at projects on the internet i don't really fancy it uh, and i get bored at a point uh, so uh, i missed uh, this opportunity to have a physical contact with art um, to have a chance to discuss it with the people that are next to you so i kept uh, studying various websites for uh, fairs and projects uh, uh, to to be in the context but whether it was a positive experience or not i can't even tell uh, now I I feel that being physically able to be present, uh, uh, being uh, pre being present at exhibitions physically is very important. Uh, even with the digital projects, uh, well, there are some projects you can only uh, see with your smartphone. But when you do something with your hands, I, as an artist, would really miss an opportunity uh, to have a chance to show my works to the people in a physical form. Thank you. You want to go next, Nadia? Uh, well, what I've seen in my own practice, in terms of changing my practice, had a lot to do with this uh, you know, internet hype, a lot of things being available online. And uh, there were some works that played with this idea. Uh, uh, when a person uh, loses this chance to talk to, to another person and to uh, express uh, him or herself emotionally, physically in space, uh, would uh, place it all online, would put it on online, all online. And there was a moment when I realized uh, that I can't speak about myself. It became more difficult for me to work, uh, to, to do projects that had to do with my body, with my emotions, with my physicality. For the first two months, I wanted to keep silent, to keep mum, to do nothing and go back to some manual artistic labor and uh, to work in, in this isolated uh, mode. So it was an important stage of accepting people, accepting myself, accepting uh, the fact that everybody needs to speak about themselves. And uh, we need to cohabit uh, in this space and we need to limit ourselves or uh, accept the fact that we need to speak about to speak about our feelings, about our, our worries, about the way we live through these days, not to disappear into this isolation and uh, to, you know, to keep sane, to keep being sane. And I think uh, that uh, the project that I've realized in this art, within the Art Pro uh, Prospect Festival, it is, uh, in a sense, a continuation of this attempt not to speak about myself. So I'm using the space which is not private. I'm opening access to something, telling about something. I it would be difficult for me to create a work uh, that would be speaking about my own space. So this is the experience I had. The things I was used to do and the things I focused on, or I used to focus on using my body, uh, my physicality, became more problematic for me. So uh, this is my personalization moment. This is my personal experience. And, and Nadia, I'm going to be coming back to you with a question from the audience. So hold on to that. But Lisa, let's hear, let's hear what your thoughts on, on how this has changed your work, your practice, and your message. Well, I, 
I will probably have a different story to tell uh, because this isolation, if we're talking about psychological pressure, it hasn't really affected me. I used to work uh, with this Wall for Scroll project for Vladivostok, so it was all digital. And uh, uh, I, I kept, you know, sitting at home working on this project. I, I used my computer. I didn't have to go anywhere. I could, you know, focus on my laptop sitting at home. Um, what is interesting, if we're talking about new practices that I have picked up, I suddenly needed to do more manual stuff. And I started to uh, do embroidery. Uh, I took a plastic bag that I had at home, and I decided to Im make an embroidery on a plastic bag. And while I was doing it, oh, I had this feeling uh, I needed to document my, my life, my time in the process of doing it. And I, I knew that I was uh, uh, dedicating my time to this process and each moment, each minute of my life is in this embroidery, in each little stitch. And uh, uh, this is uh, this became uh, a starting point from a, from a new trend in my work. I decided to make this plastic bag series with embroidery, and it also led me to uh, uh, to the thoughts of personal data and how I could uh, display this data in an analog way. So I've been collecting my uh, personal data in a table, and I uh, embroidered them with uh, using a uh, code. Uh, and I think this project would stretch for for a year. So this self isolation and being confined uh, uh, led me to a new artistic practice. The saying goes, necessity is the mother of invention. So new work comes out of being in this isolation, which is fantastic. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we, we are taking questions. And so if you have any questions, please you know, pipe them in the questions answer period. Um, and I have a question for, for Nadia. And it looks like it disappeared. Oh, yeah. So the question is, um, Everything changed in Belarus in August. The protests happened in public spaces, both online and on the streets. Despite dangers of the pandemic, activists, women in particular, have been unyielding despite violence and arrest. You yourself have been arrested and imprisoned. How do you see your art practice in this? Uh, well, the question is about our context uh, uh, that goes beyond the pandemic. Uh, problem, uh, uh, so the safety and uh, health, uh, security and pandemic uh, is no longer relative, relevant because uh, despite those dangers, uh, people are protesting. And the situation I went through only uh, confirms my stand and my understanding and uh, the stand uh, of many artists and people of culture. In this situation, uh, the majority uh, uh, gets politicized, uh, can't help it. Uh, I consider myself, uh, I don't consider myself a political artist and uh, even reacting to certain events happening uh, in my country or in other countries, but what's happening this year in Belarus um, is so complex, so violent, and 
uh, I can't I can't find any analog analog to it. I mean, I I can't pair it with anything. You can't help but react, regardless uh, of the uh, of uh, your wish. You any work you do is be, becomes an activist work, and uh, I heard it from someone else. Uh, when I described my case uh, and I asked, do I need to, to write in my application that I'm an activist? And the person from another country, uh, he said, uh, well, you're all activists in Belarus now. So I wanted to make a work uh, that would not reflect reaction, uh, reaction. You, you can't make a work that wouldn't reflect those reactions. Uh, and this is a similar message we're get, getting from outside uh, what uh, uh, and regardless uh, of the fact uh, whether we touch upon some political uh, issues or not uh, attracts attention of the law enforcement and this is what happened to me uh, I I'm not at all uh, active, I mean, close to activism, and I'm not politicized, and I mean, I'm not political in my uh, expression. Um, it's a, just a general artistic reaction to what is going on. But my works, yeah, well, I had some works that uh, do react uh, to, the, to the things happening. I hope I answered the question. You did, but I actually have another one, and I'm going to ask you first, but I, I also want mm -hmm. others to think about this. Um, again, and, and there's a sort of, we keep repeating this idea of, of working as artists in this time, and this time, depending on where you are, has many different meanings. There's, you know, the conflict in, in Belarus, there's the racial tension in the United States, there's, you know, all these, there's the environmental issues in, in, in the West, uh, so everything. So my question to you is, what advice w would you give other artists who is trying to deal with these issues in an artwork, understanding that there are consequences to some of the artwork that you're creating? You know, what advice are you, are you able to, what, what, what wisdom can you impart on others who, who may be in your situation? Um, and again, this goes for every one of you. I'm going to ask you that question, but I want to start with you, uh, Nadia. Честно говоря, такое, наверное, чтобы давать какие-то. Well, to be frank, I don't know if if I'm able to give some uh, some well thought through advice. Uh, it hasn't been much time since it happened to me, and for me, it's always a question. I understand that uh, there is this effect that works. And uh, I understand that my piece of adv advice would be do what you find important, uh, tell what you find important. And if your message, your statement is going to help someone or uh, will be, uh, uh, will come in tune. Uh, this work uh, might bring consolidation and support. I heard a lot of uh, people uh, uh, telling me uh, during this time between uh, uh, the moment I made my work and the moment uh, that I was in prison. I mean, it's always a risk. Uh, the risk is, uh, um, can be uh, bigger or smaller, depending on the country and on the situation, well, you need to understand the scale. Uh, you need to understand what are you ready to cope with. Because uh, uh, there are people who are so eager to express themselves uh, and make their statement transparent and loud, and they know they'll, they're going to be punished, so to say, for it, uh, and they're ready to go for it, and, and they get what they actually uh, 
can predict. But in certain situations, you, you can't even foresee that your statement uh, will sound uh, louder than you thought it would. And uh, then you have to live through, um, through a challenge uh, and uh, you, you see things being done against you and you find them unfair. But whenever you do something, try to envisage and try to understand what are you able to endure. Everybody uh, lives it through in a different way or experiences it in a different way. Before uh, I was uh, detained uh, uh, after a performance, it's a working performance. Uh, uh, what I felt and what I experienced uh, was that in any case, uh, you're saying something when you can't help, can't help it. Uh, you might find it scary or dangerous, uh, uh, but I, I cannot uh, say that every artist should do that. Uh, in this situation when, uh, like, uh, in, like with what is going on in Belarus, nobody is obliged to do things. And uh, I don't think that artists must react. Uh, it must always come from within. And it, will, it must be as honest as possible. I like that you end that it must be as honest as possible. I think this is very key to, um, you know, in any artist working in, in a way that will really speak to other people, particularly when there is um, social issues involved. Okay. Um, Alesa, let's start with you. What advice? Well, I agree with Nadia a lot, and I think that an artist acts because uh, he or she needs to say it, and you, uh, you cannot not do it. And if you have this urge, if you have this um, need to say it, you do some work, you create a work, you don't really think about consequences, but uh, I think it's a very like silly or crap thing when you have this self-censorship because of your fears. Um, yes, honesty is, is of paramount importance. And I will simply support what Nadia has said. You can't demand anything. Uh, but if you want, you yourself want from the, you know, from the bottom of your heart, you want to, to make a statement, make it. Uh, don't think of anything else. Think about your statement. Think about your message. I hear a recurring theme here. This is good. Um, Nastia. Yes, I wanted to add that it is very important to think about your message and to be honest, in my experience, I probably never found myself in such drastic situations, but I've been part of an exhibition that supported Yulia Tsvetkova. She's now being charged for distributing pornography because she, she drew vagina. Uh, and uh, she showed like female body in her pictures, in the drawings she made. And I, uh, what I noted, since there's been a precedent of charges being brought against an artist, uh, uh, what one needs to do, one needs to find uh, human rights defendants, uh, lawyers that could um, help you, give you a piece of advice if, if anything happens. And uh, you also uh, must go public, as public as possible, uh, uh, 
um, ask media uh, to write about it, make everybody know about it. Uh, I wouldn't compare it uh, uh, to uh, protests in Belarus, but uh, uh, art, well, artistic or creation. Uh, it's one thing, but maybe uh, finding uh, legal uh, support. And this is an, a piece of advice I would give. Again, support, legal or otherwise, is always good. Thank you, Nastya. Uh, Annie, what's your thoughts and advice for folks who wanted to delve into this, this whole realm? Well, I, I, yeah, when, I mean, it's very interesting to hear about this, especially in the context of politics and to talk about it, because when the pandemic first started, I was really like one of my first questions was how do people protest now? And the answer has been really clear that when the um, issue is um, as dire as it is, people will just take to physical public space. And um, in terms of this answer that I've heard, like, you know, your unique talents, I think that that can manifest itself in many ways, depending on, I, I think when this started, I asked myself, what do I have to give? Um, and what do I feel comfortable giving? Um, so that those were important, like an important question to frame how I can contribute during this time. Um, and I also think that artists are unique in that they can navigate many systems under the skies of art. Um, and it can be a sort of, I don't want to say sneaky way, but a way to, to, to be productive and influential without going through like proper systems. Um, and I think that that is something unique to the artist, especially during this time. Thank you, Annie. And Lara, you, I, I know you're full of advice. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I look forward to um, what you have to share uh, with folks today. Well, thank you, Kendall, for this very important question. I feel that each artist uh, has given now a very honest advice, piece of advice, and I could only add that it is very important to be together, to keep together. And going public is very important. We've been talking about safety and security many times. And uh, I think that being public is a tool that helps you uh, enhance your safety. Um, helps you make yourself more safe. So support each other, stick to each other. Simple but pure gold, as expected. Uh, <laughs> so we, we only have about three minutes left, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to really thank CEC Arts Link. Um, for putting this together, not just this talk, but the entire festival. I think this is something that we really need now. This is something that is important now. It's important for all the artists who are participating to have a place to speak, have a place to congregate and connect ideas and exchange ideas and other types of conversation. So I wanna um, personally thank um, for uh, CCR to put for putting this together, I also want to thank you know the artists who um, spoke today, um, and particularly at this last question, really sharing advice because uh, I have noticed, and I'm sure a lot of you have noticed, is that you know some of us are not doing well, and some of us are struggling, and on on many levels. And I think um, artists are really key in in getting us through that, and you know as some of these projects illustrate that, you know, sometimes we just need to hear that we're not in it alone. Uh, this is a common theme that I've been hearing for, for the whole day is sort of this connectivity, togetherness, you know, trust in oneself. And I think that's all important. And 
uh, I just wanted to say that. I also want to put a plug in for for tomorrow. This is there's also another talk. Uh, it's called the presentation of the publication miracles or misunderstandings socially engaged art in the countries of the art prospect network. We get field report reports from Azerbaijan, Armenia, Belarus, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and the Ukraine. Um, so I encourage you all to uh, log on to to that one as well tomorrow, and really, you know, look on to the artprospect.org website and participate as much as you can in experiencing some of these projects. So some of them are really, really cool. And, um, and hopefully next year, maybe, we will get to do this uh, as we usually do it in, in person, in real life. And, um, and yeah, so uh, I just wanna, again, thank you all. Thank you for inviting me to participate. I, I miss you all very much. I miss the traveling. Let me tell you, I'm suffering over here with the traveling. But, but again, you know, um, we, we, we'll get through this. We will get through this. Uh, and before our last minute, I just wanted to ask if Susan or Natasha or anyone else wants to, to say anything in closing. I just want to say thank you, Kendall, for moderating this conversation and thank you to all the artists. And it was really wonderful to meet you and see you. And that's for us, I think the saddest part of not having the Art Prospect person, Art Prospect Festival live here in St. Petersburg or in other cities is not getting to see you and talk with you and meet you. But um, I'm really glad that we could bring the group together at least virtually on Zoom um, and um, thank you for participating, and we look forward to continuing collaborating with you. So good night, everyone, and see you, some of you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.